everybody. My name is Monika Kovács. I am the Vice Dean of uh, this Faculty of Education, and it's an honor to welcome you uh, here at our faculty. Uh, we are very uh, uh, happy that this uh, event uh, could take place, and we are thankful for the Tom Landos Institute for cooperating with us. Uh, and uh, this is not the first time we are cooperating. We had a summer school uh, last summer on prejudice, genocide, and remembrance, uh, which uh, will be uh, again this summer. So uh, I can say uh, that we have now a, a, a long-term uh, cooperation with the uh, Tom Lantos Institute, and it is because uh, uh, we are uh, very comfortable with the views and with the values and with the goals of the Tom Lantos Institute. And uh, so that's why we are happy you all are here, and we are happy that this important and interesting and uh, uh, difficult question will be uh, discussed today. I really hope that uh, after the uh, presentation, we will have a chance uh, to, uh, to uh, discuss the topic also. So it's not only presentation and go home. Uh, rather, we really uh, welcome your uh, notions and your thoughts about it. So very welcome. And uh, I give Anna-Marie, uh, the uh, director of the Tom Lantos Institute, the work. Thank you very much, uh, Monica, ladies and uh, gentlemen, and some of our friends, long-term friends, I should say. A warm uh, welcome to you to the fifth uh, public lecture of the Tom Lantos uh, Institute in the series entitled From the Courtroom to the Street. I would like to thank you, uh, thank uh, Dr. Monica Kovac, uh, for inviting us uh, here and also to the uh, Faculty of uh, Psychology and Education of the Ötvöslóran uh, University for allowing us to have um, this public lecture at this particular university. Those who attended some of our public previous public lectures know that we have all these lectures at a different um, university. Now, before introducing uh, Dr. Sejal uh, Parmar, I would like to say a few words about the Tom Lantos um, Institute. We are a relatively new uh, organization that works in the field of human and uh, minority rights. And uh, we like to think ourselves as uh, of an organization uh, that um, stands at the intersection of human rights and uh, identity politics and uh, investigates through multidisciplinary approaches the problem-solving capacity of existing national and international norms in the context of a tripartite mandate our work um, focuses on Jewish life and uh, anti-Semitism, Roma rights and uh, citizenship, as well as uh, human and minority rights with a particular focus on Hungarian uh, minorities. While appreciating the importance of legal approaches and remedies to violations, TLI is primarily interested in the broadest possible socialization of human and minority rights. It is this individual and societal ownership of norms as standards of behavior that we see at the most significant aspect of the realization of human rights. As a result of this approach in the first years of its existence, Tom Lantos Institute focuses on human rights uh, education. And uh, in this context, it is understandable that uh, we have this uh, series of uh, public lectures of issues of human rights of particular uh, importance. As I mentioned before, this is a fifth of our public um, lectures. The first um, uh, public lecture was delivered by um, uh, Tomai Tileman, grandson of Tom Lantos, chief advisor to Hillary Clinton, then Secretary of State John 
uh, Kerry. Uh, he delivered uh, the inaugural public lecture about the nexus of human rights and uh, liberal uh, democracy. This was followed by a public uh, lecture by um, Joshua Castellino of the Middlesex University of London on the international minority protection um, regime. Then um, we had um, David Gilborn of uh, the University of Birmingham delivering a public lecture on race rights and uh, education. We had Margot Salomon of the London School of uh, Economics uh, to deliver a lecture on um, uh, economic uh, and uh, social uh, rights, and Gudmundur Alfredsson on human rights education. So it is in this series that uh, I would like uh, to invite uh, Dr. Sejal uh, Parmar to deliver uh, her lecture, but not before mentioning that we are very thankful to Sejal um, um, because she was the one with whom we conceptualized this uh, series of uh, lectures uh, at, in her little office uh, at the Central European University where she works. And it's been nearly one and a half years later that uh, Sejal, who has also worked with uh, Article 19, one of the leading uh, INGOs, international non-governmental uh, organizations on freedom of expression, that she now comes and delivers a very important lecture on a very uh, important topic. Sejal. Well, thank you very much, and thank you, um, Anna Maria, um, the Tom Lantosh Institute, your team there, Monica and um, Elta, for inviting me here to speak, especially given the very eminent um, series of speakers that preceded me on this uh, very timely topic. Discussing freedom of expression has become a dangerous business. This past Valentine's weekend's shootings in Copenhagen claim the lives of a documentary film director attending an event on art, speech, and blasphemy, and a voluntary uh, synagogue security guard, and thus added to the toll of those who have been killed in the name of religion this year. I wonder whether some of those people who registered for this event here tonight, which is hosted by an organization working against anti-Semitism, right next door to a synagogue, reconsidered their attendance because of those attacks um, at the cafe and at the synagogue in Copenhagen. It has already been suggested by Danish intelligence services that the Copenhagen shootings were a copycat of those in Paris six weeks ago. The Paris attacks at Charlie Hebdo's offices and at a kosher supermarket, which left eight journalists and nine others dead, have seemed to electrify the world into discussion, debate, and also further violence around the issue of freedom of expression. Yet the killings at the European venues of uh, discussion and worship in the name of religion simultaneously attacked freedom of speech, freedom of religion and opinion, and also freedom of worship. Um, sorry, freedom of speech, freedom of opinion and expression, and also freedom of worship, freedom of religion or belief, as yesterday's um, Guardian editorial observed. These events, therefore, deserve to be contextualized against a complex background of two wider and worrying trends. First, the upsurge in violent attacks against journalists and media workers around the world. According to the Committee to Protect Journalists, the past three years have been the deadliest since it started compiling such records in 1992. And second, the various manifestations of violence, discrimination and intolerance against religious groups as horrifically evidenced by the latest ISIS atrocities, the brutal beheadings of 21 Coptic Christians in Libya, and also shown by the Boko Haram killings in Nigeria, the hostage taking in Sydney, and the anti-Islam demonstrations in Germany recently. What is clear is that we urgently need to come up with global 
policy responses as the world seems to, as uh, uh, Hugo Muir said in The Guardian yesterday, lurching towards a new normal where protest is advanced through murder and also spiraling into a state of chaos around our values and identities. My purpose here, despite my um, background as a um, lawyer working for uh, a global organization on freedom of expression, is not to deliver some kind of sermon on the merits of freedom of expression or defend freedom of expression in absolute terms. It is also not to express my approval of the messages and perspectives conveyed by the cartoonists of Charlie Hebdo. I emphasize at the outset that defending the freedom of expression of Charlie Hebdo's satirists does not equate to an endorsement of the views they chose to advance. First, I will look at how this has become freedom of expression's moment, given the profile and attention poured on the rights over the past six weeks. Second, I will identify and reflect on a range of threats to freedom of expression that have been exposed and amplified by the attacks on Charlie Hebdo's offices in Paris and the responses to them. And third and finally, I will turn to my argument, which is, at this time, the case for freedom of expression needs to be urgently and coherently remade, and the responses to the attacks um, in Paris, Copenhagen, and others that may be in store must proceed on the basis of international human rights approaches, particularly on freedom of expression and on combating religious intolerance, um, approaches that have evolved over the past um, five years. The Paris attacks have stimulated a heightened level of consciousness on freedom of expression, as I said. They have provoked a deluge of responses from states' leaders, NGOs, intergovernmental figures, journalists, satirists, bloggers, and members of the public, with freedom of expression at their epicenter. Indeed, it is difficult to recall a time when freedom of expression as such, beyond the narrower conceptions of um, media freedom, freedom of the press, and free speech, have captured such broad attention throughout the world, or polarized it. Freedom of expression has been repeatedly invoked, hailed, qualified, and contested in France, in Europe, and internationally. A universal belief in freedom of expression, as President Obama put it, or our unfailing attachment to freedom of expression as a universal value, as the joint statements of the ministers of the interior of the EU put it, has framed the outrage of world leaders and the millions on the streets. Incidentally, um, as many of you uh, would recall, one of the um, prominent um, high-profile voices which drew attention to limitations on freedom of expression was that of uh, Pope Francis, who said, you cannot insult or make fun of the faith of others, Um, which stands in contrast to um, the um, other individuals that I spoke of. People have taken to the streets of Paris and major Western cities, including London, Brussels, um, New York, Montreal, but also Jerusalem, Istanbul, and Tokyo, in record numbers in a gesture of collective solidarity against the Paris attacks. Je suis Charlie has become a rallying cry for freedom of expression on social media, with the hashtag Je suis Charlie being tweeted more than five million times in the first two days following the attack. This past weekend's shootings in Copenhagen have also been quickly condemned by relevant international actors such as Dunja Miatovic, the Special Representative on Freedom of the Media of the OSCE, and human rights organizations such as Article 19 and Index on Censorship. These have also served to revive the opinion writers' reflections on the place of freedom of expression in Europe. From this perspective, in terms of attention and consciousness, one could even argue that freedom of expression is sort of having a heyday. Yet, the reality could not be further from the truth, of course. Freedom of expression is under extraordinary pressure from state and non-state actors, not least because of the forces of religious extremism. At the end of his tenure, in July 2014, the former special rapporteur on freedom of opinion and expression, Frank LaRue, said that the state of freedom of expression was in a worse state um, then than it was at the beginning of his mandate six years before. 
The Paris and Copenhagen attacks were sparked by speech that was and is offensive to certain religious sensibilities. They form the latest chapter in a story about freedom of speech and religious censorship that stretches back more than a quarter of a century to Valentine's Day 1989, when in a distinctly unromantic gesture, the Ayatollah um, Khomeini, the supreme leader of Iran, delivered his fatwa on Salman Rushdie. It is a story that also obviously includes the torrent of violence that swept many countries following the publication of offensive cartoons by the um, Danish newspaper Jalens Posten in 2005. But this current chapter of the story is necessarily distinguished because of the rise of the internet and social media as a means to disseminate information and ideas, including ideas which cause offense to religious sensibilities. At the time of the fatwa on Rushdie in 1989, the World Wide Web was still a proposal um, waiting to be delivered one month later by Tim Burgess-Lee. And in late 2005, um, uh, at a time when the Danish part cartoons were sparking controversy all over the world, um, there was only around a billion um, uh, internet users so about 15.8 penetration. Now there is three times that many, um, at a, a 40, just over a 40% uh, percent penetration. Turning now to the uh, threats to freedom of expression posed by the um, Paris attacks and their responses. Um, as I said, these have exposed and amplified a number of challenges to freedom of expression as a universal right. Um, these challenges, which have to varying degrees highlighted, have been highlighted in burgeoning commentaries, show that the threats to freedom of expression are complex, diverse, and interwoven as much as they are global. The first, the most serious and direct challenge is that of the assassin's veto. Where the heckler's veto says merely, I will shout you down, the assassin's version is, Dare to express that, and we will kill you. As Timothy Garton Ash explains in the current issue of the New York uh, Review of Books, Charlie Hebdo's journalists were targeted and lost their lives precisely because of their defiant lampooning of Islam, particularly of the Prophet Muhammad, as they saw that as a legitimate and necessary form of expression. The cafe shooting in Copenhagen seems to go even further by targeting a discussion on free speech, art, and blasphemy. The effects of this assassin's veto, as Garten Ash calls it, encompass not only silencing through murder, but also the silencing that takes place because of the fear that takes hold, the chilling effect that is left in its wake. Media organizations are especially impacted. Consider the different choices that newspapers made as to whether to reprint um, Charlie Hebdo's cartoons in the aftermath of the Paris attacks. The decision of the editors of British newspapers not to republish any of Charlie Hebdo's uh, previous cartoons on the 8th of January, the day after the attacks, and um, subsequent days, um, could be viewed as an act of self-censorship, motivated by a refusal to run the risk um, that their staff uh, would be physically um, threatened or attacked themselves. Um, but this contrasts with the approach of many um, newspapers on the continent um, in countries such as Belgium, Denmark, um, Germany, and the Netherlands. Interestingly, when it comes to Denmark, Jarlens Posten decided not to republish the cartoons with Fleming Rose, um, the um, foreign editor, and the man who commissioned the original cartoon saying, we caved in, violence works, sometimes the sword is mightier than the pen. While for many commentators, the decision not to republish the cartoons was driven by respect rather than fear, that term respect um, is, as Gott Nash argues, so uncomfortably intertwined with fear of the assassin's veto. 
After careful editorial consideration, The Guardian and The Independent reprinted the cover of Charlie Hebdo's comeback issue on the grounds that it set a conciliatory conciliatory tone and was not gratuitous, with the Prophet Muhammad weeping whilst bearing a sign, Just Read Charlie, beneath the banner, All is Forgiven. But surely more editors would have reprinted had they known that others would do the same. The second challenge is nothing less than the universal appeal of freedom of expression, which is being um, uh, challenged. Whilst people took to the streets of Western capitals on the 11th of January in solidarity and unity, a perception that freedom of expression is an exclusively Western ideal has spurred um, violent protests and marches across the uh, Muslim world. Um, such as those in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Algeria, Kuwait, Lebanon, Tunisia, uh, Sudan, Niger, and Gaza, following the depiction of the Prophet Muhammad um, in Charlie Hebdo's comeback issue. As The Economist observed, free speech is, in many places, at best, a wavering ideal. The third challenge I identify is that of the duplicity and pretense of states, particularly authoritarian and illiberal ones with respect to freedom of expression. Many political leaders' statements and gestures in support of freedom of expression in the immediate wake of the Paris attacks have seemed rather hollow, hypocritical, and frankly ridiculous given their domestic practices and policies. The challenge has been well exposed thanks to a 21-year-old LSE student, Daniel Wickham, who tweeted about the human rights abuses of 21 of the so-called standard bearers of freedom um, of press represented at the Solidarity Rally in Paris on the 11th of January. Remarkably, Wickham's... um, Tweets were retweeted more than 18,000 times, including by such uh, prominent free speech um, uh, figures such as Glenn Greenveld, and also covered by the media. Prime ministers, ministers, and high-ranking officials from states with seriously troubling free speech records um, from states such as Egypt, Bahrain, uh, Algeria, the UAE, Turkey, Gabon, and Russia were among leaders at the head of the rally of 1.5 million who marched down Boulevard Voltaire. Hungary should arguably be mentioned in this cluster of states, given that Prime Minister Viktor Orban marched for freedom of expression too, despite this state's clamp down on the media. Perhaps the strangest presence was that of the ambassador of Saudi Arabia to France, who attended the Parisian rally just two days after the state flogged 50 times the activist Raif Badawi in the first of a series of 1,000 lashes, um, which was supposed to be carried out uh, over 20 weeks as punishment for insulting Islam. Given this forum, it is important to mention that in what the Boston Globe called a dramatic challenge, um, Katerina lantos Schwet, chairwoman of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom and Tom Lantos's daughter, and six of her colleagues, sent a letter to the government in Saudi Arabia on 20th of January. Um, and each of these uh, members of the uh, commission offered to take um, 100 of Badawi's lashes. After being pressed by Amnesty International UK, the heir to the British throne, Prince Charles, also um, raised Badawi's case to um, the Saudi king, um, but in in a much less dramatic fashion, I think. The fourth challenge concerns responses um, of states in the liberal heartland of Europe to the Parisian attacks. Um, which depart from and hence undermine the values of freedom of expression for which their leaders rallied in Paris. European states are seeking to beef up their counter-terrorism laws and policies, combat radicalization, and tackle growing anti-Semitism. And they're doing that legitimately. But their responses have exhibited a distinct lack of consideration of rights Um, and values, chief among them freedom of expression, rather ironically. In the wake of the Paris attacks, the French government has cracked down on speech that constitutes apologie du terrorisme, 
According to the French Ministry of Justice, between the 7th and 29th of January, there had been some 486 cases linked to the attacks of Charlie Hebdo. 257 of these involved individuals accused of condoning or provoking terrorism. About 41 of those had been quickly pushed through the courts with 18 people having been given prison sentences in a remarkably short length of time. One of those under investigation is the provocative uh, comedian uh, Dieudonné for writing on a Facebook um, uh, wall that he felt like Charlie Koulibaly, a reference to both Charlie Hebdo and the kosher supermarket gunman. Expressing a different opinion against the dominant or official line on the Paris attacks has had severe consequences. Consider also the case of a man who was arrested for drunk driving and then shouted at police that there should be more of the gunmen who attacked Charlie Hebdo and that he hoped that they, i.e. the police who arrested him, should be next. Meanwhile, in the UK, not content with um, the the security agencies, GCHQ's far-reaching surveillance powers as exposed by Edward Snowden, including the ability to access material collected by the NSA and other spy agencies without a warrant, the Prime Minister, David Cameron, has called for a further ramping up of security services powers to to, um, intercept all online communications and also to break encrypted messages, something that would affect journalists and the communications they have with sources more than anything else. Um, There's also um, more anti-terrorism measures going through Parliament at the moment. So narrow conceptions of security are once again uh, pushing out more measured considerations and policies based on rights. The fifth and final challenge concerns the inconsistent and selective legal and policy approaches to freedom of expression in Europe, which cannot be ignored as we consider the responses to the Paris attacks. Whilst European leaders have indicated their support of Charlie Hebdo's um, freedom of expression as encompassing the magazine's freedom to offend, um, and also they have taken a clear stance against blasphemy laws um, in their international policies, laws on blasphemy are still on the statute books in some EU member states, such as Austria, Denmark, Finland, Greece, Ireland, and Italy. Plus, laws on religious insult or vilification of religious feelings remain an offence in many EU states, such as Cyprus, the Czech Republic, Spain, um, Lithuania, Portugal, and Slovakia. The inconsistency has prompted the European Human Right Humanist um, Federation and the International Humanist and Ethical Union to launch a campaign for the abolition of blasphemy laws worldwide. The incoherence, be- the incoher- incoherence between many EU member states' domestic and international positions is coupled with um, a problematic inconsistency in the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights on issues concerning artistic expression. Although the court has on innumerable, innumerable occasions re- reiterated the part of its judgment in Handyside and the UK setting down the principle that freedom of expression encompasses the right to disseminate information or ideas that offend, shock and disturb, um, a phrase which has been re- reiterated many times in, in recent weeks, it has also mandated blasphemy laws on the basis of state's margin of appreciation and a lack of a European consensus. Um, moreover, it has allowed convictions for genocide denial, but only in relation to the Holocaust so far. Um, Moreover, the court has also refused to hear the complaints of um, Moroccan nationals about the cartoons that Yailin's Poston published in 2005. So or, given all this, it's little wonder that the external projection of Europe, Europe's legal reality when it comes to freedom of expression is a major obstacle to European states' persuasiveness um, on freedom of expression globally. So how should these momentous um, challenges, um, or some of them of the moment, but others are um, much more sort of um, long-term, 
um, and have been there for many years, how should these challenges um, be um, approached in the wake of the Paris attacks? There certainly needs to be a revival and a reminder by leadership figures of the reasons why protecting freedom of expression is fundamental as the best way of getting to the truth or the nature of reality, as the, main, as the means of keeping our elected representatives in check in a democracy, as a way of promoting development, and as a way of realizing ourselves. Recalling such rationales at this time needs to be coupled with the recognition that freedom of expression is actually a universal rather than a uniquely French, American, or European ideal a universal yearning, as um, the president of Columbia University um, uh, wrote in, a, in an opinion piece in the Washington Post uh, five days ago. Uh, witness the situation of countless journalists, writers, bloggers, and activists who knowingly risk persecution, imprisonment, and torture in states from Azerbaijan to Eritrea to Vietnam simply for expressing their views before suggesting that freedom of expression is just for Europe or for America. Recall the fact that a cry for free speech um, still forms a key part of the demands of people and groups in the least free part of our planet, the Middle East and North Africa, despite um, the fact that the Arab Spring all but failed in, uh, in, in those states, um, apart from Tunisia. In the past days, various responses um, or solutions um, to the Paris attacks have been forthcoming. The technical. Garth and Ash um, has suggested the development of a safe haven website devoted to the republishing and dissemination of offensive materials, which are considered of genuine news interest, but which media online and offline refuse to publish. This site would have an anonymous board, strong editorial procedures, and would not be US-led. There are various problems with this proposal. It could mean editors might pass the buck on difficult decisions, and um, as Kenan Malik has said, there might be an auction of victimhood or competition amongst publications just to get onto this um, website. Um, there have also been market-orientated or um, economic um, solutions uh, proposed. Lee Bollinger, again, has suggested that promoting global freedom of expression norms uh, should take place by, quote, harnessing the prevailing international commitment to free markets and a global economic system which demands the open sharing of information through the establishment of a new international trade regime that protects journalism, academia, and digital information. Leaving aside for the moment further engagement with these proposals, I would like to finally turn to my argument about global norms on freedom of expression. While states have focused on tightening up their counterterrorism and security policies, the significance of global human rights norms as a set of global uh, fundamental values has largely been overlooked. In crafting their responses to the Paris attacks, political leaders, religious figures, and social commentators have steered, it seems, clear away from the international rule of law, even as they have appealed to the concept of the rule of law itself. My argument is that they should look to the human rights approaches at the international level on freedom of expression and combating intolerance on religious grounds in particular as providing a credible and legitimate framework in terms of the substance and the process by which these norms were developed in order to develop strategies that are coherent and measures, measured and involve all states taking stock and putting their own houses in order. In addition, through promoting a global consciousness on freedom of expression that is based on international human rights law, we can also avoid... Um, uh, a version of freedom of expression which is um, reductively understood. International human rights law, under Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, can and should provide the normative framework in shaping um, our policy responses at this time. 
Article 19 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which was adopted in 1966 and now has 168 states who have ratified it, states that everyone shall have the right to freedom of expression. This right shall include the freedom to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas of all kinds, regardless of frontiers, either orally, um, in writing, or in print, in the form of art, through any media of his choice. This is not an absolute right. Limitations may be provided if they meet a legitimate aim, such as uh, the protection of the rights of others um, or the reputation of others. Um, uh, and those limitations must also be provided by law and necessary. Article 20 of the International Covenants on Civil and Political Rights then says, any advocacy of national, racial, or religious hatred that constitutes incitement to hostility, um, discrimination, or violence shall be prohibited by law. The percolation of international human rights protections across societies around the world certainly takes time as Bollinger argues, drawing on the experience of the First Amendment, which he says, or notes, um, took 50 years to move from, quote, the periphery of America's civic consciousness to its center. But contemporary events mean that there is a particular urgency in understanding international human rights insofar as it provides a framework um, for responses um, at this time. This urgency is only enhanced by the fact that global bodies have developed highly relevant international interpretations on matters of expression and relig relig religious intolerance. These provisions have been subject to heightened levels of critical discussion and inter interpretation by key UN human rights bodies. The outcomes of the reflections in Geneva, mainly, um, but not only, speak directly to all states in their efforts to protect freedom of expression whilst also addressing advocacy of religious hatred that constitutes incitement. I'll now highlight some of the most important aspects of this international human rights framework which must, I say, inform responses to the Paris attacks. International law does not allow restrictions on expression which is considered blasphemous or insulting to a particular religion or belief system. International law protects the rights of individuals, believers and non-believers, and groups, but not abstract in entities such as religious ideas, symbols, and tenets. According to the UN's Human Rights Committee, um, uh, its authoritative interpretation on Article 19 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, that provision on freedom of expression which I referenced earlier, um, laws on blasphemy and religious insult are, as such, incompatible with Article 19 of um, the ICCPR. From an international law perspective, therefore, blasphemy laws should be abolished unequivocally everywhere. And this has also been emphasized by other international sources, such as the Rabat Plan of Action and the various statements made by successive special rapporteurs on freedom of opinion and expression. The fact that um, authoritative interpretation of international law as it has evolved now stipulates that blasphemy laws ought to be abolished provides a strong basis for establishing a mutually supporting and robust international network of advocates against blasphemy laws, as proposed by a number of humanist NGOs. The development of such a network is particularly crucial at this time when, in many states, such as Pakistan, even opposition to blasphemy law can itself be um, uh, viewed as blasphemous. Alongside repealing blasphemy laws, states need to step up their efforts to combat religious intolerance and incitement. By effectively implementing um, Human Rights Council and General Assembly resolutions on the subject, um, these resolutions have been um, adopted since uh, 2011 um, after the Organization of Islamic um, Conference, as it then was now Corporation, decided not to um, propose a resolution on combating so-called defamation of religions. So there is now a consensus around religious, um, how to combat religious intolerance. 
Human Rights Council Resolution 1618 of March 2011 states that, among other things, states should encourage the creation of collaborative networks to build mutual understanding, um, promote um, dialogue, and inspire constructive action. They should also create an appropriate mechanism um, within governments to identify and address potential areas of tension between members of different religious communities and also assist conflict prevention and mediation. Significantly, states' um, leaders should speak out against, um, including um, advocacy of religious hatred, intolerance and incitement to discrimination, hostility and violence. There's another significant international um, instrument called the Rabat Plan of Action on Incitement, which also urges states to adopt a multi-pronged and consistent approach to instances of incitement to religious hatred, encompassing criminal sanctions if a high threshold is met, um, as well as civil and administrative sanctions um, and measures to promote civility and respect in societies, as well as comprehensive anti-discrimination legislation. The Rabat Plan also highlights the moral and social responsibilities of the media in combating discrimination and promoting intercultural understanding. It is important to emphasize that the process for developing these UN texts sets some important precedents in terms of international cooperation on freedom of expression, and in doing so raises their sense of global legitimacy. The hard-won consensus between Western and Islamic states that underpinned the resolutions on combating religious intolerance and incitement, as well as the cross-regional processes that led to the Rabat Plan of Action, um, show that states and non-state actors can come together to agree, to agree on some basics of freedom of expression, albeit through lengthy and tough negotiations. These international human rights approaches should now be at the very forefront of the work of key um, uh, actors in framing their um, responses to the Paris attacks, encouraging them to tackle the difficult underlying challenges to the realization of freedom of expression, as well as freedom of religion and um, equality in their societies. They should serve as a rallying point around which supportive states, NGOs, the media, and individuals across the world can gather, most obviously in support of a campaign against blasphemy laws. Public awareness of the key elements of these texts is crucial. The essence of these standards clearly needs to be understood more widely, beyond the elites of diplomats, civil servants, advocates, academics, and activists that work within um, and with the international human rights system. In the face of powerful forces, this certainly requires major efforts of persuasion by states, NGOs, and the media, in addition to those of um, human rights bodies. But unless ordinary people, particularly the millions, billions of Muslims around the world, can come together across regions, religions, and belief systems, including um, no belief systems, um, then um, the deadly attacks and the waves of violence because of conflicts on expression and religious ideas are likely to continue unabated. So my argument is that the case for freedom of expression needs to be urgently remade, um, and the moment for a deeper understanding um, of freedom of expression um, is now, um, and that this needs to be done on the basis of international human rights standards. Um, thank you, and I welcome your questions and comments. Thank you very much, uh, Seja, for the uh, extremely thought-provoking and in many ways unsettling uh, presentation. So um, I hope that um, you have uh, similar impressions and we invite your uh, questions uh, now to be uh, discussed and uh, answered. And after the question time, we will invite you to a short um, uh, little reception beyond the screen. Yes. Thank you. Alexandre Kiss, uh, trainee at um, the Belgian Embassy. 
Um, actually, my question is a double question. Um, first, uh, don't you think that, um, yeah, okay, m many scholars and uh, people agree that uh, the EU failed to integrate Muslims um, in our countries? And now they are taking several measures, like regarding security, for instance. Um, don't you think that um, those several measures may be a wrong way to deal with uh, those problems? And that could um, maybe uh, even more marginalize, marginalize Muslims instead um, of uh, really integrate them. Um, the, my second question is, don't you think that uh, this is a more complex question that's only about um, freedom of expression? Because uh, in my opinion, uh, censorship won't necessarily solve uh, the problems regarding terrorism and the growing uh, marginalization of Muslims here in Europe as uh, moderate Muslims. Though they do not agree with those caricatures, they accept its existence as anything else within the democracy. So one do you think that it would rather profit to Salafist terrorists uh, ensuring their uh, actions may be fruitful. So. Um, yeah. C can I just ask you to rephrase that final question? Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not yeah, okay, exactly no sure whether I understand it. Yeah, no problem. So my question was that, don't you think that censorship won't be necessarily solved, uh, won't necessarily solve the problems regarding terrorism and the growing marginalization of moderate Muslims that already accept this existence as anything else in democracy we do not agree with, but rather profit to Salafist terrorists in showing uh, that their actions are fruitful and give them ground for further actions. Um, okay, thank you very much for your questions. The first question about um, um, tackling marginalization of um, the Muslim populations in Europe. I, I absolutely agree. I think um, it has to be part of a comprehensive strategy uh, to combat extremism and uh, radicalization. Um, the acknowledgement that current policies, current approaches aren't working. And it's a complexity of um, you know, issues that force um, individuals into um, extremist actions, um, you know, foreign policy, um, socioeconomic issues, um, but also um, domestic uh, policies and approaches such as in, in, in France, this um, notion of laïcité, the, the notion of secularism where everyone, um, everyone's identity is flattened out as being French. Um, you know, the, the debate around the um, wearing of the headscarf and other um, um, uh, items of clothing um, showing um, religious affiliation. Um, I think the sort of inherent biases um, in states' policies, which reflect um, a kind of prioritization of certain cultures, needs to be addressed, and that actually what is required is a going back to a very unfashionable idea which is multiculturalism a recognition that Europe is multicultural and that the voices of different communities religious communities including um, need to be heard in debates on an equal basis um, and I, I don't see that that is happening you know the the um, the uh, killers in Copenhagen and in Paris, um, but also in connection with other um, terrorist attacks in Europe um, since 9-11, whether in London or Madrid, you know, tended to be so-called homegrown terrorists, you know, individuals, young men who had been radicalized within Europe. Um, so we have to, and this has been said, um, and to a certain extent recognized by states, although not effectively so far, it seems, um, that, that socialization process that leads to someone um, who has been grown, who's grown up in Europe deciding that they need, to, they need to take radical action has to be addressed. So yes, I agree with you on the point of marginalization. As far as um, censorship not working, I also agree with you. Um, you know, silencing, um, silencing people 
um, and having far-reaching laws which don't allow them to discuss um, and refer to um, in any kind of positive way, in a critical way, um, the Paris attacks are likely to be counterproductive. Um, I mean, you see at the moment with the hundreds of uh, criminal cases in France, um, just in the last six weeks, um, in connection with the um, Paris attacks, that um, you know many of those prosecutions just just seem ridiculous. I'm not saying that action doesn't need to be taken, but that that action needs to be um, measured. And you know, one of the themes of my speech was um, that the very values that you know European societies purport to uh, defend, um, including freedom of expression, are being threatened by their policies in response to the Paris attacks. So yes, thanks for your comments, and yes, I agree with you. Thank you. So <clears throat> I. I like your idea or your point that we should try to try to uh, deal with this crisis with international human rights law. But uh, many may argue that that cartoons of Prophet Muhammad uh, led to hostility or danger of hostility, discrimination, and violence. So I wonder how do you think uh, we could come to a broad consensus internationally in terms of understanding these uh, these uh, elements of of the relevant international law thank you um, thanks for your question um, Peter um, so yeah international law does um, prohibit um, any advocacy of national, racial, or religious hatred that constitutes, constitutes incitement to hostility, discrimination, and violence. You're right. When it comes to actual um, prosecution of um, the, um, uh, the publication of the cartoons, there have been actually cases um, in, in France, I think, um, where the courts have found that the um, cartoons did not reach the threshold of incitement. And if you look at them, you know, I don't think that they would meet that threshold. It's a very high threshold according to international law. The Rabat plan says that there are there are six um, criteria which have to be met, including uh, context, context um, the position of the speaker, and so forth. Um, so um, I don't think it would um, meet the threshold of, of um, incitement um, to violence. But I can see your point that there may be um, the issue that these um, cartoons are viewed as promoting um, hostility and, and discrimination. From an international law perspective, there, there, it's not just about banning speech. You know, there is a whole panoply of measures which um, might be resorted to, and measures which actually the media themselves can um, adopt. Um, there needs to be a background of anti-discrimination law. Um, uh, intercultural understanding should be advanced by um, state institutions, but also the media. Um, the media should also be adequately representative of um, minority groups. Many of these um, guidelines, um, because it's not binding law, the Rabat Plan of Action, but nonetheless it does provide a, a, a policy framework for a broad range of actors, um, would um, be a response to the argument that um, the, uh, the cartoons did somehow promote uh, discrimination and hostility. So it's not just about the criminal law, um, international law, when it comes to the, these um, um, forms of expression which um, touch a nerve from a religious perspective. There are a broad range of measures which can be taken. But, you know, the focus really is upon the um, enforcement of the law in, a, in an equal way and an emphasis on more speech. You know, so, um, you know, people in the public eye should take an opportunity to condemn the perspectives raised by the cartoons. So, um, yeah, so, it, it, you know, freedom of expression being used in a positive way. You mentioned that um, there's a very high bar for something like where freedom of expression goes into uh, incitement to hatred or something like that, and probably rightly so. But in common discourse, in our normal social interactions, we have 
a kind of self-censorship about things you don't say and what constitutes insult and things like this. Is there a case for saying that there should be some responsibility in the use of freedom of expression, given that it's not a universally accepted value? People in many cultures, sort of decency and proper behavior are things which are given more value to, and that the irresponsible use of freedom of expression uh, may impede creating a pop popular culture in which freedom of expression is seen as a good thing. Mm -hmm. So Article 19 of the um, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights is the only um, one which has a, uh, an extra bit which says freedom of expression carries with it certain um, duties and responsibilities. So it is inbuilt into international law that there is a responsibility when exercising one's right to freedom of expression. Um, and, you know, there, there are um, various ways in which that responsibility can be, um, I guess, sharpened up without imposing um, restrictions on freedom of expression. So, for example, when it comes to um, the role of the media, um, there are initiatives to promote ethical journalism, for example, um, which um, don't mean regulation um, by the state, but you know, involve um, the media in drawing up ethical guidelines about practices when it comes to, for example, um, uh, including in a representative way um, voices from minority communities or different perspectives. Um, so, I mean, I think that word responsibility has to be taken um, carefully at the same time. So, you know, whilst the media ought to have ethical responsibilities, um, some states might interpret that word to mean, well, you know, this is just another avenue for imposing further restrictions on, on free speech. So, um, so, so yes, I agree with you, but, but let's not take it so far that it can um, be used as an excuse um, for um, further censorship. Um, talk and taking us through so many different kind of key areas about um, this, this range of issues. And I just, I wanted to maybe ask the large question, which is if you're optimistic about the future for freedom of expression. And the reason I'm asking that is it seems like there's two different strands of conversation that come out in this kind of, um, uh, and when we're trying to look at what it means, what the Paris attacks means mean for freedom of, for the future of freedom of expression. Because on one hand, there's a lot of really important um, global standards and norms that you're, that you're, meant, that you're discussing and, and, and um, you know, the, the importance of um, Article 19 and these other kinds of, of resolutions. Um, but on the other hand, we have to have the will for there to be the kind of uh, uh, self-regulation, if you will, so that we don't go down the path of um, uh, reg over-regulating content, which it, it seems very clear that you're, you know, make very strong arguments as to why that's really dangerous for freedom of mm -hmm. expression. But on the other hand, that whole, this whole narrative of surveillance and what you were mentioning with, especially with, with, with David Cameron and, and, and Orban and other governments seeking either more control over traditional ele elements of media um, or also just trying to uh, garner more information in the name of um, national security. So I, the question is about optimism, but I was asking it also in the sense of how do we bring together these two different strands of protecting freedom of expression with an emphasis on more speech and self-regulatory measures at the same time as we balance the, um, the rightful concerns over these um, governments' desires to have more surveillance. Um. Well, one could say that the, the, the surveillance policies that the governments already have go, far, go too far. And there's a number of cases um, going through the courts, um, uh, including cases which have already gone up to the European Court of Human Rights um, and in states such as the UK and the US on surveillance. And it, and it looks like the governments, um, certainly the government of the UK, is being taken to task over the scope of its um, surveillance powers. So, you know, the premise of your question that... Um, the, the interests in surveillance as dragnets and as mass, on a mass scale as it is, are legitimate. I, I would sort of um, 
uh, contend with somewhat, but I, but I take on board your sort of provocative question about um, whether I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic insofar as um, freedom of expression um, and the values that underpin it um, have some, some, some discussion in a positive way at this time. I think, you know, it, it just can't be a flash in the pan moment. Um, you know, yes, there needs to be political will, but political will and then some. Civil society and media also have a role to play in raising that global consciousness. Um, and it will only be through the demands of the people, I think, um, that any, any, any sort of change for the positive will happen through, you know, that's, that's my perspective. Um, when it comes to international law, you know, even though I presented it as being sort of more of a done deal than, um, than perhaps um, it, it was a few years ago, um, that it's still fragile. So consensus around this resolution that I spoke of, which you know, very few people beyond Geneva know about, um, Resolution 1618, is still you know, rather fragile. It was the result of a you know, number of years of um, resolutions of, uh, on um, defamation of religions, and suddenly we have consensus that defamation of religions, blasphemy laws out, it's not right from an international law perspective, it's not acceptable, um, and that we have to go down the road of how to combat religious intolerance. And there is a policy framework there. The thing is that it's not being disseminated, you know, um, and uh, I, think, I think that should be the starting point. So, so allowing that information to flow from these um, UN capitals um, as a basis for a kind of a civil society and public understanding of what freedom of expression is. Um, and in that sense, I would be pos um, optimistic. But I think there needs to be a lot of hard work done, and um, uh, yeah, especially in, in Europe. I will abuse my role uh, yet again. Um, uh, Sijan, if, uh, uh, if I understood you well, you said that when uh, all those presidents and prime ministers protested against uh, uh, what happened in France, uttering the words, uh, Je suis Charlie, then um, um, in their protests, uh, they did not make reference to the international framework of uh, human rights and the existing norms, whether legal or soft, uh, which you presented um, here so well. Some of these um, marchers and protesters were, as we know, dictators who themselves abused uh, uh, freedom uh, of uh, speech and other human rights. But how do you explain and? Uh, uh, how, how could you explain that um, some of the, you know, leaders of, of, of the democratic world, they, in their protests, did not make reference to these norms? I find that astounding. These are the heads of duty bearers. Mm -hmm. These are the major duty bearers who agreed on these norms. It is through their consent right. that these norms exist. I find that very unsettling. Mm. I mean, indirectly, you could say that um, EU leaders, President Obama, did refer to a global notion rather than a domestic notion of freedom of expression by appealing and using this term universality. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I guess it's partly messaging you know, that if they kind of start talking about international treaty law, they're going to lose people. And this is about having immediate responses to the Paris attacks. Um, but I agree in terms of like the, the one level down um, responses, there are few resp there are there are hardly any um, governmental um, responses which are based on international human rights standards. It's the intergovernmental organizations. It's the, it's the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. It's experts um, um, at the regional level that are referring to those norms or non-governmental organizations. And it's a constant battle to have them appear or um, integrated into policy measures. But, but, I, but I, I get what you're saying, and um, the, the universal principle of freedom of expression was referred to, but perhaps not enough. 
Um, but, but I guess it's about messaging. What we have to really be concerned about is what happens when you scratch beneath the surface. And there, it's, it's at the moment all about security, little about human rights and safeguarding the values, in a way which, frankly, reminds one of um, you know, the, the discussions around the Patriot Act in, in the aftermath of, of 9-11, what's happening in France now. Mm. No other questions? Well, then, there's time for uh, a small reception. Seja, thank you very much again. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs>